Okay, uh, uh, thanks everyone for joining me. It's my pleasure to present this uh, topic. So, Fred, do you mind to? Oh, yeah, I just want to remind you of that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, so basically, I want to take a detour from the main course uh, line that we are following to look into uh, geometric deep learning from the perspective of symmetry. So, the presentation will have two parts. Uh, hopefully, uh, today we can finish the first part, which is uh, linking the geometric deep learning formalism with the symmetry. So uh, this framework was uh, proposed, uh, I think, uh, this year, earlier this year, by uh, Michael Brownstein. Um, there's an excellent book about uh, how geometric deep learning basically unifies a couple uh, deep learning models, which I will going to introduce in the first part. So um, as you can see, there will be a little bit of group theory and uh, we'll, I will talk about uh, symmetry from the perspective of more, more or less from physics. And uh, I will then talk about two geometric priors. Uh, one, like one is symmetry, the other one is uh, deformation stability. And if we, and I will, um, you know, because our group is very familiar with graphs, I will basically use graphs as example uh, along the presentation. And if we have time, I will also go over the intrinsic geometry and uh, isometry, which is another, it's, it's also kind of symmetry. So, so first I want to uh, briefly talk about geometry from, you know, from the, I think geometry is like the favorite tool of, Physicist, uh, modern day physics is basically based on geometry. So in the early days, Plato is the Plato and the, of course, the Pythagoras, they were ancient mathematicians and the philosophers. They have this kind of mystical belief about math, whether it's an invention or it's objective. So Plato postulates that, uh, you know, all the objects that we observe uh, consist of what, what's known as the Platonic solids, basically. Those are part of, uh, if you're familiar with the platonic forms, these are like the ideal objects that constitute the world. And Euclid was the first mathematician that has this, uh, you know, uh, axiomatic system of geometry. And for a thousand of years, I think uh, 1,000, uh, almost 2,000 years after him, uh, Newton uh, basically built the, uh, the, the mention of classical mechanics on the foundation of Euclidean geometry. But later on, as we know, uh, geometry is not objective. Geometry is like, a, like if you look at it from a mathematical perspective, then it is a axiomatic system. And you can invent new axiomatic systems as long as it is consistent. So in the uh, late um, 19th century, early 20th century, Russian mathematician Lobachevsky and uh, the famous French mathematician Henry Poincaré, they uh, invented new systems of geometry that's somehow consistent. And as we know, it's also very powerful in their own right. And uh, in the 20th century, we see a great boom of modern physics inspired by Riemann's uh, elliptical geometry, uh, and it, which was also the central focus of the study group uh, the manifold. And uh, again, physics physicists build upon the foundation that mathematicians provide. And nowadays our view about the universe is basically Einstein's uh, general relativity. So, so as you can see in the history, there are lots of different kinds of geometries, right? So people kind of have different opinions about what is a geometry, like what, what is the definition? And in the year uh, 1872, uh, the German mathematician Felix Klein says that geometry is the study of invariance under some class of transformation called a symmetry. So it is called the Erlangen project because he was back then a professor at Erlangen University in Germany. And the idea is basically uh, you want to link geometry with the more abstract mathematical concepts. And in, back then it was the group theory. So, so symmetry 
So, so the geometry, like from here, you see like the, the essence of a geometry is its symmetry. And the symmetry is basically defined by group transformations. And this book, as I mentioned earlier, it provides you the complete picture about it. And the same analogy can be made to today because we have seen so many different kinds of uh, deep learning neural networks. CNNs, GNs, uh, transformers, deep sets, RN. They're somehow like all these different kinds of geometry. And then the geometric deep learning framework is what uh, uh, I think Professor Michael Bronstein says, the Erlangen project of uh, deep learning. You want to unify them more under the same framework. And as we'll see, it's actually very good for learning purposes because as students, it's always nice to have a theory that organizes everything. So as, as a machine learning people, we know that there's a very difficult problem to solve the curse of dimensionality because when your dimensionality goes high, there's so many different hypotheses and learning problems are very intractable if you don't have a good inductive bias. So, um, so you, as we know, inductive bias is a very recently, it's, a, it's kind of a hot word for deep learning. Uh, you, uh, machine learning people basically, you try to get insights from other disciplines of science and you try to construct um, architectures that somehow reflects more fundamental realities. And in the example that I'm going to give in this presentation is geometry. So, so first we need to formalize the vocabulary when we talk about geometric deep learning. There are a domain, what's known as a geometric domain. Uh, if you look at this example, the images that we are uh, processing in the CNNs, they're basically, uh, you know, discrete objects, the this uh, uh, grid. So each grid is like this kind of, uh, you know, ZN. ZN is basically integer um, of n dimensions, cross product with ZN. And for each single point in your geometric domain, you can provide a 3D RGB tensor that describes the color at the position. And that is called the feature space. And uh, in, in the vocabulary of uh, signal processing, the RGBs, they are called the channels, which in this case is three dimensional. And, and the, in the vocabulary of geometric deep learning, the mapping between the geometric domain and your signal uh, and your feature space is called a signal. It's a, it's, a, it's a mapping, it's a function. As we will later see, this kind of functional formulation fits very naturally with group theory. And this is another example of a molecular graph where your geometric domain is a graph, which is basically adjacency matrix with the vertex. And then your uh, each vertex you can assign, say, atomic number, which can be a one hot vector. So, um, so we want to provide some structures, mathematical structures for the domain of signals. And most importantly, as we will later see, we deal with convolution. So with convolution, you need uh, the definition of an inner product. So here, uh, it's just a very fancy name for inner product space. It's called a Hilbert space. Basically, you can define the inner product uh, on the domain of signals, which we will uh, use as the mathematical formalism in the convolution. So this is an example about the Hilbert space or inner product space that uh, I think we are all familiar with, the Fourier series. It's, uh, it's basically invented by Joseph Fourier to solve the heat equation um, that was proposed early, earlier by Isaac Newton. It's basically, uh, you know, second order derivative with, with another name called the Laplacian, which we, we will also cover later on. So, the forward trend, the forward series is basically you take any L periodic functions and you decompose it into periodic sine waves. And it can be formulated as a inner product between your Fourier basis, which are periodic sine waves and your original time domain sig uh, signal. After that, you get your like frequency representation and your inverse, uh, inverse, you know, if you want to go back from the frequency domain to time domain, you uh, uh, sort of compute the inner product again with the Fourier basis. 
the generalization of the Fourier series is the Fourier transform, which gives you, um, you know, a functional basis expansion of any kinds of functions, continuous function. And, and as you can see here, the formula then in uh, inner product space is very elegant. You just, uh, the Fourier transform of your signal is basically inner product between it and the Fourier basis. And the inverse transform is another inner product. So, so once you are very familiar with the notation of inner product, you can sort of get rid of all the integrals and just write it in this very uh, neat format. So that's that's the example I want to give about the inner product space. And so the first geometric prior is symmetry. So as I mentioned, symmetry is, uh, you know, the inherent kind of property of the geometric domain, such that if you apply a transformation, you would want to preserve some properties. And basically here the example is for image, for, for example, if you have an image classification task uh, and you shift, translate that the image, you would still have the same image, right? Your, um, your label should not change, your, like, your uh, CNS output should not change. And for graph, you know, the, the ordering of the nodes, the, you know, the permutation matrix, if you apply a permutation matrix to the adjacency matrix, after that, you should still have the same graph. If, if we were doing a, gra a graph classification. And the manifold is uh, more about uh, isometry. Isometry is basically, if you have a continuous deformation of the manifold, you want the, uh, the Riemann matrix to stay uh, you know, the same, which uh, if we have time, I'm going to talk about in the end. So the mathematical language that we use to describe symmetry is called the group. Uh, this is a sentence, it's called numbers measure size, groups measure symmetry. And group theory was uh, proposed by Galois in the early 19th century. Um, so this is the formal definition of a group. Uh, it's basically a binary operator that's, that's very, it's kind of abstract. It only talks about composition. And these are called the group axioms. So associability, activity, identity, inverse, and closure. So you look at this and as machine learning person, you can already think about a very, uh, a group that's kind of everywhere. Uh, so for example, matrices, invertible matrices, uh, the, the group of invertible matrices, uh, it's, it's called a general linear group. So basically, it, it basically uh, satisfies all these four axioms. And we also know that matrix multiplication is not commutative. So it is known as a non-abelian group. So if the group is a commutative, it's called, it's called a Bayesian group. And here is an example of a group. It's a discrete group uh, that consists of, uh, it has two generators. This generator is basically the basic, uh, you know, group actions that can, you know, generate all the different types of group actions. But the group itself contains uh, six elements. And as you can see, if you compose any of these elements, you are still you can still find something in the same group. For example, uh, if you do a rotation twice and then you will do a reflection, you can do a reflection and uh, do rotation. Right? So it's like commit. Uh, it's kind of associative. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, what kind of um, order you're doing. So. Yeah, so that's a that's an example of a discrete group. Um, and just to give you some context of the importance of group theory, so group theory is a very fundamental uh, mathematical theory that sees its um, application in the natural sciences. And I remember Liang, we have an email from Professor Sun about uh, material science. So basically, the molecules uh, that you see, they are three D. Even though nowadays we tend to use a 2D graph to represent them, but uh, the chemists, they classify molecules based on their 3D symmetries, such as like your ro rotation, reflection, you know, identity uh, symmetry. And and modern physics, basically, you uh, there's a very fundamental theorem it's called Noether's theorem. It says that every continuous symmetry, there is a conservation law. 
And if you look at this table, you can somehow appreciate this kind of fundamental connection. So conservation of momentum was a very classical uh, conservation law. Like if you learn classical mechanics, it's like the most basic conservation law. And it is restricted in the Euclidean geometry because once you go into a four dimensional like space time curved geometry, then momentum somehow is not conserved because when your geometry change, your, your symmetry groups change and the certain conservation laws actually do not change, or, or do not hold. The same goes for energy. So we know the famous Einstein's, uh, you know, the energy mass equation, you know, energy can turn into mass and vice versa. So, so uh, in, in the four dimensional space time, it's also not a very uh, conserved quantity. However, angular momentum is a uh, conserved quantity in the four dimensional and is mathematically related to rotational translation. In quantum mechanics is the conservation of charge uh, and it's related to quantum mechanical phase, which is another symmetry, symmetry group. So the left side is the, are the groups and the left side, uh, right side are the conservation laws. It's a very general and fundamental connection. And uh, gauge theory, is the physics theory that formulates our current standard model of uh, elementary particles, basically uh, the fundamental Higgs bosons and the quarks. The discovery of this kind of uh, these particles are actually thanks to group theory. It's all like theory, theoretical stuff. And uh, yeah, and this is also explored in deep learning and uh, it's called like gauge symmetry, gauge equivariant networks, which is a something that hope, I hope to also cover a little bit in the end if we have time. So, um, so like when we talk about groups, we don't just uh, care about group on their own right. We uh, want to apply groups to our geometric domain. So we kind of want to see how a group acts on our domain and our signal. So, so the general definition of a group action is basically an operator that maps an element from your geometric domain to another element in your geometric domain. And the transformation follows, of course, the group axioms, such as associativity. And, um, and here, uh, this is an example of a group action that was given by Professor Bronstein in the formulation of uh, group like in the geometric deep learning, and and this is like a definition, and 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 I just want to give you a, a sanity check. So, so actually, uh, I want to show you why this is a this is a valid. So, so here, um, so here I want to write some like derivations that get us kind of more comfortable with group. So, so what we were doing is the definition of a group, like group is a G is a group. X is like our signal, right? That maps a uh, geometric domain to, um, you know, the, the feature space. So the group action is basically your group which is an operator, or you can think about high level like a function. It, it's applied to the signal. So the definition given by uh, Professor Brownstein is that it's this. And the first step is we want to examine if this is a valid definition. So to say it's a valid definition is to say this definition uh, agrees with the uh, group theory. And one specific group axiom we want to check is uh, associative. Um, property. So what that means is that for any two different group G and H belong to the same or group element belong to the same group, we want the following. So, so this means, what this means is basically we want to have like them together as one operation acting on the signal. And we want this to be the same as if we apply H first to the to x, and then we apply g. So, so you can see like this is basically uh, commutative, right? G h and you kind of no not commutative, associative. Sorry, so you kind of put the bracket in a different place. 
So this is what we want to show. Now, how, how does this work? So uh, the left-hand side, we just apply the definition of a group action. So, so what this is, is just the X and the GH inverse U. And this is just uh, X and, and for inverse, the kind of just uh, recall like matrix inverse. So this is like H inverse, G inverse, U. That's the, the left-hand side. So the right-hand side, it's a little bit more uh, tricky. So what we do first is we kind of do a change of variable. We let X prime equals HX. So this becomes a G X prime U, which becomes like, you know, the, the form that we're familiar with. So, so this becomes G uh, X G inverse X prime G inverse U, uh, U and this becomes H X uh, G inverse U, right? And this again is something we're familiar with. Uh, that becomes H inverse G inverse U. So these two are equal. That's why this is a valid uh, definition for group action. So I hope that is clear. Um, any questions or, okay, if not, then let me continue. Uh, with an intuitive understanding of why this is a you know, valid group action. So you somehow like think about moving an image over the grid. So you can do it two ways. You can fix your grid and you move the image right, which it, in this case, move right, it's like a translation group, right? It's translation group with a G here. And in this case, U is your, uh, X U is your image. Well, U is your grid. And, and you can do it the other way, which is you move the, the domain itself, right? You, you kind of fix your image, but you move your domain uh, to the opposite direction. That's why you have an inverse transform. That's the intuitive kind of understanding of a group action. Yeah. So, so uh, another example of a group action is in convolution. So this is sort of the classic uh, signal processing definition of a convolution. You have a signal, you slide a filter over the entire uh, domain, which, it, which usually, usually are like a, uh, the, the set of all the, the real numbers, or in this case, the set of all the um, two-dimensional grids. So you can do it two ways. You can either fix your signal and you like slide uh, the filter right, or you can do it the other way, you know, like you, you, you fix a filter and you move your signal in the opposite direction. So because you are doing it over the entire domain, this, these two operations are equivalent. This is another uh, example of a, of a group action. So, so in machine learning, we don't just care about like uh, abstract groove transformation. We, we want to deal with the matrices. That's why um, this concept of uh, group representation comes in. Basically for every group transformation, you map it into a uh, invertible uh, real matrices. And after your transformation, the group action definition still holds basically uh, you, it's, it's like you apply your matrix transformation to your signal is the same as if you apply your uh, transformation on the domain and the uh, inverse transformation on the domain and apply the signal. It's, it's an equivalent representation, but now we can feed it into your computer. So, so with the symmetry, here are the two most important concepts. The first one is invariance. As we know, the definition of a symmetry kind of is after your transformation, you need to leave some quantities unchanged. So in this case, it's like we apply, a lean, for example, if we apply a linear translation to the image of a cat and we have a classifier outside, we should ex still expect the, the label to be the same, the up label to be the same. Right. Yes. So the finite dimensional linear group representation, there, is there any other constraint about what the matrix mapping should be? Because 
the easiest, simplest kind of a uh, representation that I can come up with is just map everything into an identity matrix, and then everything becomes kind of obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that was a that was a. It's also valid because it's a it's, it, you know it, it uh, satisfied all the group axioms, right? Right. Uh, in this case, it's just it's even more useful to have uh, the the space of the uh, invertible real matrices. Right, right. So my question is like. I assume there is some additional kind of notion of this is much better representation than the other one, much more carries a lot more information about the groups, that particular yeah. group that you are dealing with. Meaning that when two group elements are different, then we may want to have the representation should be different as well. No? Yeah. So do we, do we usually make that assumption, original assumption? I don't know too much about representation theory uh, or representation theory, but this one seems to be, def this simple definition seems to be a little bit too simple. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this is basically, so it, it's, it's, it's the definition for the machine learning uh, people because we, we, do, we don't really have a very good foundation. That's why this definition actually comes from the, the book by uh, Professor Michael Brownstein. So. Oh, so kind of he, a, yeah. he, in his book or in any of his work, he doesn't have any constraints like one-to-one -one mapping, no. So here it's just, uh, you know, it, oh, you mean the, the mapping between a group to uh, matrices, like Matrix, the, yeah. the, the mapping here, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they didn't really talk about whether the mapping is one-to-one -one or like on two or something. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Right, so just the following with the, uh, the previous discussion is that, you know, you, you apply some transformation to the image, it should not change the label. That's the idea of the invariance. So the example, of course, that we are familiar with the, is the graph. So with a graph, we don't care about nodal orders. Uh, we do some permutation matrix over the adjacency matrix over, you know, uh, which changes the graph structure and changes the graph signal, but it basically is just a relabeling of the graph. So in the end, we should expect the same output if we have a graph level task, such as a you know, graph classification. And another example is the deep set. The deep set is basically a bunch of points which you don't expect there are any edges between them. So this in this case, you just do a nonlinear um, map on each of the points and then you sum them up like uh, you know a, a global pooling and then after that you have another nonlinear layer so this is the original deep set which the the pooling is a sum it's a summation but you can change it into any kinds of uh, global pooling that's invariant to uh, such as you know average um, or any kinds of uh, pooling like global pooling so we know that when you do this um, invariance constraints, it's only good if you have, like you, you care only about the global level features because you lose lots of information with the poolings, like the average global average pooling and global max pooling, for example. Uh, if you care about node level features, then this is not very desirable. You need something more. And that's why there's another notion called a group equivariance. So uh, equivariance is basically, the uh, like example given is the uh, image segmentation is that you want to have some localized representation of the cat so that if you move the cat in your, in your uh, image, the learned feature, so this is kind of like a feature map in your intermediate layers. Your feature should also translate. It should also move somewhere. So, the, C the convolutional neural network is actually very good at this because it's a, as we will later show, it's a translational equivariant. So that if you move some object in your original image, the feature map would also uh, do, the, do the similar kinds of transformation. This is, uh, and you can see the mathematical formalism. It's like, it doesn't matter if you do the, uh, the group uh, representation first or you apply the classifier first. So it, it basically, you can treat it, treat the F here as a feature extractor, like um, uh, in, in their vocabulary, the, the feature map. 
So, and with graph, um, we also have a permutation in covariance. And this is basically, we explore the localized uh, information. For every node, we care about its neighbors. So, so compare, uh, in contrast to the previous notion where you, you have a, a equivalent nonlinear map that applies to each individual point. Now you apply the nonlinear map to an individual point and it's one half neighbor. And then your, um, your feature matrix kind of look like this. And if you apply a permutation matrix to your feature matrix, uh, you know, which result, which, which basically uh, results in the permutation of nodes and the permutation of the, uh, the graph signal, you should see the permutation matrix applied to the entire feature function. And that's basically um, the notion of uh, group equivariance. And all the modern graph neural networks have this kind of building uh, you know, structure. As we're familiar with this, is if you have a node that uh, basically talks to its neighbors, the most basic formalism is graph convolutional network. Um, and you also have other kinds of like message passing schemes that's doing this thing, uh, which I will also return back to in the end. And of course the vocabulary of graph neural network is the, the, the files are, and, and this is also important, the files they need to be uh, locally, like locally uh, node order invariant. So you kind of have a invariance that's embedded in your equivariance formalism. F is normally called a GN layer, and this is also called a message passing, diffusion, and propagation. And here is a it's a kind of like a summary of all the geometric domains, sets, uh, topological space, manifolds, metric space, graphs, and they all have their kind of inherent properties that you want to preserve. And uh, yeah, and they ha also have their corresponding groups. So as we know in deep learning, uh, one of the very major success is that you stack lots of layers of neural networks. So each layer is like a different, uh, like a feature extractor and you somehow want to have the feature extractors respect the symmetry of the domain. And as we'll see, there are two different kinds of symmetries. One is called global symmetry and one is called local symmetry. Uh, this is a good example. The local symmetry here considers that uh, that your uh, local uh, filters to be node order invariant with respect to the one half neighborhood. And the global symmetry is the symmetry that regarding the permutation about the entire graph structure. So you have global filters and local filters and which you can also imagine in convolutional neural network you have local poolings and global uh, poolings. It's, it's kind of the same idea. What is compositionality? Compositionality is basically you stack multiple different functions together and you can get something more. That's basically, uh, you know, like that's basically the, the idea that the, the reason why your deep learning neural network works better than a more shallow one is perhaps that uh, you know, under under the under the, the multiple layers of feature extractor, you get much richer features in the, in the in the middle. But the but of course the, the notion here is that the compositionality itself doesn't give you uh, enough information. Your 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 feature extractors need to have more knowledge about the domain for for your features to be useful. The first the first sentence, compositionality is a fundamental inductive bias of deep learning. I don't know what that sentence means. <laughs> okay, so, so it's kind of, I think the, the, the idea here is just that the uh, deep learning is you stack lots of layers. And, and in, in a mathematical sense, you stack, you compose lots of different functions. So yeah, so basically, um, yeah, this, this sentence is, is actually poorly written, I think. Uh, but anyway, it, that's the basic idea. Yeah, 
Yeah, so there are lots of jargons in deep learning. So the inductive bias, it just appears like heuristics, like yeah. human prior knowledge to something. So then you can, you try to leverage that heuristic to build your model. For the composi compositionality, I think in image domain, uh, for example, if we want to do like a face recognition, then uh, if we try to understand what the convolution neural network is doing, it's like, Initially, they just extract these very raw features like strokes, and then they put these strokes into like the, the, the parts of, of the face, for example, eyes or nose. And then those eyes and the nose then putting together, it just form the face. So this, I guess the compositionality is like referring to this one. Yeah, I, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I, I'm just a little bit, uh, I kind of a person who want to have a precise definition of the words that we are using. And I agree with what uh, Ijo says regarding uh, how I understand it. I didn't hear about compositionality before, but I heard about inductive bias, right? Inductive bias, my understanding, or at least the kind of sense that I get when I hear about it is exactly when we don't have enough uh, data, enough signals from the data itself, we somehow want to introduce some kind of a bias into it so that the final learned uh, features or whatever is something close to what we have in mind. So that is the inductive bias. That is how I understand the inductive bias. That is fine. Compositionality or the definition that Fred just mentioned seems to be uh, very much like the operators in mathematics or in, let's say, in, uh, databases, because you're kind of databases. You know, in databases, relational algebra, all these relational algebra operators, we can uh, concatenate, we can uh, input the output of a relational algebra operator in, as an input to another relational algebra operator. So that makes it kind of composable. So even though individual operators are very simple, by composing them together, we can express a lot of complicated things. And that seems to match well with the second one, second sentence, which is allows expressiveness and flexibility to represent any functional class. So if I understand the definition of compositional, compositionality in that sense, the second sentence makes perfect sense. And also compositionality itself doesn't guarantee a good learning algorithm because we don't know how to exactly in what sequence because we have to compose them and whether it is expressive enough. So that makes perfect sense. But still, the first one, compositionality, is a right. fundamental inductive bias of deep learning. Okay. That seems to be a push. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a little bit sloppy, I think. Yeah, yeah. it's a little. But but let uh, me give another example. Sure. Uh, sorry. Oh yeah, I was just about to say. Uh, it is also my first time hearing this word, so I just googled its definition. I don't. I'm not sure whether this is the best definition for compositionality, but what I found is that. Compositionality is the algebraic capacity to understand and produce novel combinations from known components. Okay. Yeah, this is yeah. what I found. That's very good definition. Let me give another example. So imagine you have a convolutional neural network and you're processing an image. So the image you care about uh, probably two kinds of symmetries. One is called translational symmetry. The other is rotational symmetry. So you want to rotate the cat, somehow you want your output to still be uh, the cat. Or in other cases, uh, you want to have your feature map also rotate with your image. When you, so there are two kinds of different symmetries. So the first layer of your neural network, perhaps you can take care of the translation. And the second layer of your neural network, you can take care of rotation. So, so when you compose these two together, you get something more powerful. So that's like, the general idea. Hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, so so the main course today is the convolution. So I want to talk about this uh, fundamental relationship between the Laplace operator and the, the Fourier transform, which naturally leads us to convolution. So uh, we know like in graph, your spectral convolution is dealing with the graph Laplace. Uh, and when I was learning it, I was like curious, like what's the relationship between convolution and uh, the Laplace operator in general? And it turns out there is a very fundamental connection. 
So uh, the heat equation, as you can see here, the time derivative is kind of proportional to the Laplacian. This is actually not the equality, but anyway, it's, it's the, this is the Laplacian operator. And the, and the Fourier basically tries to solve these partial differential equations. And, uh, be, uh, and because of this problem, he invented Fourier uh, transform. So there's a very fundamental uh, connection between these two. And if you see uh, the, the connection from here is that in the Euclidean domain, you can uh, find the Fourier basis by do uh, eigen, eigen decomposition of the Laplace operator, which gives you an infinite number of uh, what's known as the function basis, which is the fundamentals of the Fourier transform. And in the graph domain, of course, we are familiar with uh, the Laplacian matrix. Uh, you kind of do your spectral convolution, which is like a graph Fourier transform by uh, the inner product between your uh, signal, graph signal with the Laplacian matrix, the, the eigenvectors basically form the, the basis, the Fourier basis. So this is a very good uh, kind of generalization. And the convolution doesn't just uh, stop there. There are lots of different convolutions. This is the 1D convolution, which you can kind of imagine you're dealing with a ring, a mathematical ring. And a 2D convolution is the one that uh, we kind of are familiar with. And, uh, and this is a continuous signal, like signal processing definition of convolution. Like this is the very, this is in, in the book, it's called every linear translation equivariant operator is a convolution. So there is a very fundamental connection between the convolution operator and the translation equivariance. And this is why a convolutional network is so successful uh, in early times. And, and the Fourier transform has another very good property is that when, when you transform your signals into the frequency domain, you can uh, compute this uh, very difficult integral with uh, just element-wise product between the, the transformed signal. And there is a very efficient algorithm called a discrete Fourier transform. So here, first example, Euclidean convolution. In the Euclidean, uh, so here we are not, so, so uh, just kind of ignore this too, because we, we a group convolution will come later on. But uh, with uh, the Euclidean convolution, you have a filter, theta, and uh, this is the notation we use in geometric deep learning. X is your signal function. U is some point in your geometric domain. In this case, U would be from the real numbers. And the convolution can be written, as I showed before, as a inner product between your signal and the transform filter. And here the transformation is the translation transformation, which gives you this kind of uh, representation. And if you are careful, you can see this is actually not convolution. If you look at here, the convolution is defined this way, u minus v. But here we have u plus v. So, so this is actually something in deep learning is that we call cross correlation as convolution. So this is convolution, which is u minus v, the filter. And this is uh, uh, in, your, in your filter, uh, phi here, psi here is a filter. Cross correlation is u plus v. And cross correlation is the one used in the convolutional neural network. However, since the only difference is, is that the filter, uh, whether the filter is reflected and the filters are typically learnable, this distinction is kind of notational. So in the rest of the presentation, we will use convolution instead of cross correlation because convolution is just, uh, it, it sounds better and it, it, it just easier to connect it to other uh, other domains. So also here, like if you are familiar with the convolutional paradigm, there are channels that's about your feature maps. For example, here, um, here, normally there would be another summation over K over the channels and you decompose your signal, uh, sorry, this uh, signal into different components and you just uh, put your uh, feature map into different components. And then you just uh, think about them all. However, because here I, we care more about the, the formulation. So of the problem, I kind of just uh, ignore all the case here. 
that's the that's the idea. So first thing I want to share is Euclidean convolution is translational equivariant. And here, what it means is that if you uh, translate your original image, for example, some point in your image, and, uh, and uh, then the feature map should also translate. That's the general idea of a translation equivariant. And this is the proof. So first we define this group action. So in this case, the translational group. Group action is basically as we defined, you just apply the inverse group transform to your uh, to, the, to the element of your geometric domain, and then you apply the signal. So in the translation case, it's easy because the group is the same as your domain. They're all in the real number like R. So, so the translation becomes just uh, this, U minus T, translation by, by T. And then this is the, the proof. So this is basically saying, how about I apply the translation to my signal? And then I, like, I, I convolve it with the filter. It should be the same as if we first do the convolution and then we apply the, uh, the trans transformation. The, the order should not matter. That's the idea. So, so here the key derivation is from the first step to the second step, which is you do a, like a change of variable, you replace V minus T with V. The reason why this works is because you are convolving over the entire geometric domain. So the, the displacement doesn't really matter in this case uh, when we are doing theoretical analysis. And that's, and that's the result. So uh, Euclidean convolution is translational equivariant. And, uh, and now we deal with more general cases. We, instead of just care about translation group, let's care about, let's think about any kinds of group. For example, rotational group. And in this case, the, 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 your network architecture kinds of look different. Your, the formula then is that on the first layer of your network, you deal with the signals on your original geometric domain, which is uh, Z square. However, later layers, your uh, signal becomes a signal on the group itself. This is the key idea in group convolution is that you have different kinds of convolutions on different levels, layers of your neural network. And, and, and here, X uh, convolve with the uh, phi is called the feature map. And uh, later on, and, and we define it as a function of group. It's, it's, it's a mathematical formalism because we have the, flex, we have the flexibility to choose different groups uh, you know, in our layers. In this case, this is the rotational group, the discrete rotational group um, defined over the two discrete. And you see like, Different layers, you have different rotations for the for the feature map. And then, of course, we need to prove that uh, the group convolution is group equivariant, which means if you rotate your image, the feature map should also rotate. Uh, and here is the proof. And similar to the previous proof, the idea is just you do a change of variable from uh, U inverse H to U. And because they, they, they belong in the same group, yeah, like U, G and H, they belong to the same group. Because they belong to the same group, uh, the group uh, axioms hold. So you're still in the same group. So this is why this one is well-defined. And once you go through this step, the, the, the rest is just trivial. And then you get the uh, results of group equivariance. So this here is an example of uh, discrete planar rotation and the mirror reflection group P4M. It's a discrete group with a finite number of elements. Basically, if we, uh, it, it, it uh, results in this three by three matrix with uh, hyperparameters like M, which uh, kind of decide whether you do a mirror reflection, R, which decides the 90 degree rotation and, uh, and U of V is probably um, kind of scaling in, in some sense. So, so this is the example. And the first layer of that rotational convolutional network is that you deal with the signal on, on, uh, on your geometric domain and later on you deal with signal on G. 
as we have uh, talked about. But because it's a discrete group, everything is just a matrix multiplication. So, um, so this is the easier case. The, the more complicated case is when your geometric domain is continuous. And in this case, is, uh, the example is the spherical convolution. Basically, now we talk about the geometry of sphere, but we have a different symmetry group. Previously is the discrete rotation. Now here we have a continuous rotation, which is called the 3D special orthogonal group, it's SO3. And you can clearly see that the domain is also different from the group. The domain is the sphere, while your group is the uh, SO3. It's a, in their language, it's a three-dimensional manifold, where this is a two-dimensional manifold. And then the first layer of your follows the general recipe of uh, group convolution. Your first layer deals with signals on your sphere. The later layers deals with the signals on the SO3 rotational group. So this is the um, mathematical formulas for, for the two layers. Of course, because they're continuous and the computers are discrete, we need to discrete, uh, discrete uh, ties everything. And, uh, and I'm not covering it here because it's kind of a complicated process, but if you're interested, you can check out this paper about how they do it. And this is a summary of convolution versus group convolution. Um, basically group convolution is much more general. Um, and because of the nice property of a uh, group action, which you just imply, apply the inverse group transform to your domain, you can write it in this very general case. And if you are dealing with the same group, you can stack multiple layers of group convolutional layers to your network. And each layer would respect the equivariance of the group symmetry. So first, so now let's talk about a second geometric prior. It's called scale separation. The, uh, the, uh, the most general idea is that your analysis of your uh, input should not just be global, it should capture local features as well as global features. And this is a very fundamental principle because and the, the, uh, the example again, it's in signal processing. You have time and frequency domain. The time domain is a very, it's very local because you can be very precise about exactly what second, like uh, what's the signal length, for example, uh, signal strength, for example. On the other hand, uh, after you do the free, uh, Fourier transform, all you get are the frequencies, the global frequencies of each individual components. This allows you to separate uh, high frequency si uh, signals with the log uh, and the low frequency signals, but it doesn't give you time domain specific, uh, specific information. And this is a fundamental trade-off in physics. Uh, as we probably know about the uncertainty principle, it actually applies to all these kinds of transformations, you cannot resolve both perfectly in time and frequency. There is a fundamental trade-off. So, so the way that we deal with it in signal processing is called multi-scale analysis or multi-resolution analysis. So instead of using uh, the Fourier transform, there's this uh, transform called the wavelet transform. And basically it's like, let's look at this, this four images. So the first one is the time series, uh, which you can uh, imagine that if, if the x-axis is the time, then you slide time into very precise slices and you can analyze each individual slices perfectly. However, if you will talk about the frequency domain after Fourier transform, you kind of divide the frequency domain very perfectly so that you have very, very good granularity on the frequency domain, but here you have zero granularity on time domain. So the so people realize that we want both. So we want what if we want both time and frequency information? So the first idea is that you kind of have localized Fourier uh, filters for the signal, so that you have this kind of uniform uh, like granularity for each individual signal. So as your time goes, uh, time precision and the frequency uh, goes on, you kind of have this uniform localized filters. But this is not very ideal in signal processing. The reason is because sometimes when the frequency goes high, you kind of want more time precision. While if the frequency is low, you don't care much about time information. 
So this gives you multi-resolution analysis where if you, have, you, if you are in the low frequency region, you don't care much about time because the low frequency signals are, are, are less spiky and the less, you know, they're kind of uniform. So it's, it, it's less interesting in time domain. However, as you go along in the high frequency domain, you kind of care more about the spikes of the signal. So, and that requires lots of time precision. So different, uh, different scales of uh, frequency requires different uh, kind of time precision. And this is the general idea of multi-resolution analysis. And the mathematical formalism is called wave, uh, wave, uh, wavelength transform. So instead of uh, the Fourier eigen basis, you transform each individual Fourier eigen basis into uh, what's known as, a, a, as the mother wave. And uh, you, you introduce this kind of scale and the location family that uh, transforms each individual basis. And then the transfor transformation follows the same inner product formalism. It's just that uh, you change the Fourier basis with your wavelets. And, and the wavelets give you uh, different kind of filters at uh, different locations instead of that, uh, instead of the, the image that we show here, as you can see the difference. And, uh, and the, the major benefits of multi-resolution analysis is that if you have a deformation in your domain or your signal, you can have better stability in your representation. So, so this is kind of theoretical and, uh, and we can sort of just uh, look at the big picture here because later on, when we study manifold, we will have a much better understanding. So the big picture is that if you have a good representation of both the global and the local, uh, then if you go through a local deformation, you can still have a very good picture about the, the, the feature uh, from the multi-levels of representation you learned earlier. So, so again, this is, about the stability of your representation. If you use Fourier transform, you have this constant uh, deformation. Whereas if you use a wavelet, uh, you have a big O of epsilon. Epsilon is a very small uh, number. So it's, so it's basically a, a, a better at uh, resisting the deformation of your domain than the Fourier transform. And now we talk about graph because, you know, we're familiar with graph, so 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 uh, the first idea with the graph convolution, the spectral graph convolution, actually uses the adjacency matrix. But uh, adjacency matrix, it's it, it doesn't really give you lots of uh, you know uh, local uh, spectral information. If you do a Fourier transform of your adjacency matrix, you sort of get a you sort of gets like a, a uniform localized filters. And, uh, and then for graph, you, you, you need to explore the local structure of the of neighborhood. And that's why uh, the Laplacian was later used and it performs much better because the Laplacian uh, also deals with localized information. As we studied before, it's uh, about, you know, uh, the node and it's, uh, the difference kind of the difference with uh, its neighborhoods when you perform a, a diffusion on the graph. And uh, instead of using the adjacency matrix, we use the Laplacian second vector to perform the spectral convolution. And this gives us a much better uh, like a filtering than the adjacency matrix. And of course, uh, the Chabinet is another formalism that uh, specifically uh, localize your diffusion into a K-hop neighborhood. And then there's this natural extension from the Fourier transform to the wavelet transform. And instead of using eigenvectors of a Laplacian, you apply some scaling matrices to your, to the Laplacian eigenvectors. And you have this kind of uh, scaling parameter S that's if you uh, K-hop uh, diffusion for each central node. Right, and where, are these, where are these slides from? Sorry? These slides are from where? Uh, it's from, I actually made them myself. I want to know the details. I think this is very important, but the slide doesn't have enough detail for me to get all the details. Okay. 
where where can I get more details? So I think so. This one, I believe, if you just look for graph wavelet convolution on Google, you should find it. It's like all the papers they have a preliminary section that introduce graph wavelet transform. Like um, for example, stability under deformation and benefits of multi-scale representation. Oh, where are oh, they from? This, yeah. Oh, this one, they are from the, the book I talk about, the, the geometric deep learning, the 5G. Oh, the geometric deep learning? Yeah, yeah. And then this scale separation graph is from those papers. Yeah, so, so applica application of this general idea of stability of under deformation and the multi-scale representation, if you do the wavelet and they have that kind of property. And then on the graph data set, when we apply the general principle, uh, these are what you get. This part is really uh, from the papers, but the first two slides like stability and multi-scale yes, representation, yes. those are from the book. Yes, the, okay. yeah, the, this equation, the, the, uh, the inequalities that are all from the book, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, and uh, and we know like in graph learning, we deal with both local and uh, global information. So this is kind of the reflection of uh, the scale separation principle. And here even more clearly, the one hop convolutional graph neural network. Um, you aggregate the local one hop neighborhood information uh, to your as your uh, to your filter. So here they propose this uh, blueprint of geometric deep learning, where you stack multiple linear group equivariant layers that uh, somehow uh, respects the local symmetries, and of course you apply uh, element wise nonlinear uh, non reality to the uh, to the to your feature map, and then the local pooling is basically uh, your local uh, invariant filter, uh, like a symmetry, and then global pooling would be another uh, invariant filter. Uh, so you have both lo global and local scale, and then you compose all these layers together to form your uh, neural network. So I think. Uh, when I look at it, I think it's rather uh, neat um, summarization of all those different models. And uh, for and for graphs, uh, you have you know local poolings, equivariant uh, permutation, equivariant uh, layers, and then in the end, uh, depending on our task, some global poolings. And uh, and the graph neural networks under this. Sorry, I think someone is. Okay. Anyway, so 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 basically, the the graph neural networks they summarize these three flavors. Uh, in in all these cases, you have a local local pooling, uh, and you apply a shared. Uh, like a feature map to the to the to the central node and its neighbors. The most uh, so 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 uh, there are um, uh, you know uh, more and more fundamental kind of hierarchy here. So convolutional graph neural network is a is kind of like a special case of the uh, graph attention network, and the graph attention network is the. Uh, it's kind of like a special case of message passing networks because you have more freedom to choose your uh, nonlinear function here. And uh, just a special case because transformer was also in their uh, big picture. The transformation, uh, the transformer in this case is like a special case of the graph attention network where in the graph attention network you have a local neighborhood kind of uh, uh, pooling. Whereas in the transformer, you uh, kind of do a global level uh, pooling over all the nodes. And as we know, there's also positional encoding in the transformer and uh, the graph, it's, uh, and the transformer mainly deals with sequencing its original form and the graph is more general than the sequence. And here is a summary of all the architectures, their corresponding domains and the, the Corresponding symmetry group. Uh, this is also from that book. Um, 
and you can see this this provides a very general guideline on how to design neural networks uh, depending on the domain you're working with. Yeah, and this is the book um, you can take a look at if you are more interested in, in, in the topic. So I think we, so that's the first part of my presentation. Uh, we still have some time left. So I guess I can uh, talk a little bit more about a particular case of manifold and uh, the intrinsic symmetry. So, so the manifold, as we know, it's it's a, it's it's very different uh, than than the ones we talked before uh, because we can't really uh, find some global uh, group or global symmetry because the manifold is irregular and uh, it's not like a sphere, for example, a sphere you can rotate the sphere anyway in a three D rotation you get the same sphere. But the manifold, if you rotate it, you get a completely different kind of manifold. So one thing we talk about with manifold is it's called the matrix. Uh, that's like the, the defining property of the uh, Riemannian manifold is that you define this the Riemannian matrix. And the matrix is basically a measure of distance. So think about the black hole. Basically uh, the black hole uh, deforms the space so much that um, when you are, imagine if you are like astronaut that goes near the black hole and uh, you somehow you, you, you are not uh, destroyed by the gravity pool. Then your body as, as a topological object, like a smooth, uh, you know, like it will be stretched like a noodle. So this is like a, what's called the noodle effect of black hole. Is that uh, basically the domain changes and uh, the, the matrix changes. And then the, and because we are embedded in this four dimensional space time, uh, we are kind of intrinsic to this manifold and we, our body would also change when the matrix change. So this gives a very important application problem in 3D graphics is that in 3D graphics, uh, the, the body goes through this kind of uh, deformation uh, and we want to have a filter that respects this kind of uh, deformation. And that, that's the idea of intrinsic. So, so if you look at uh, this, this, uh, this, this object, it is moving under continuous uh, deformation. And if our filter is intrinsic to this domain, then the representation that our filter learns would be stable. It would respect the, uh, the matrix of the, the manifold. And that's the idea of intrinsic geometry. So before that, uh, we can go over briefly some ideas, general ideas of differential geometry. Uh, so the, all these slides, uh, they're from this link here. So if I cannot finish, then you can, uh, it's a very good reference. So the manifold is defined as locally Euclidean. Um, and for each point on your manifold, you can define a tangent space which gives you a Euclidean property. This is a notation uh, for a tangent space at uh, the point U. And the set of all the tangent spaces of a manifold, it's called a tangent bundle. And, uh, and they, they kind of specify the localness of a manifold because uh, you know, it's, a, it's a locally Euclidean uh, space. A tangent vector lives on the tangent bundle or in this case, you have a point and a tangent space. You can draw a vector from the point uh, that's on the tangent space. And this is often called a tangent vector or uh, in physics, it's also called a, you know, a directional derivative from this point to your, on your uh, tangent space. So, so uh, the Riemannian matrix, matrix is the defining uh, property of a Riemannian uh, manifold is that on each local tangent space, you can define a uh, matrix and uh, therefore inner product. So you see the, the Riemannian, it's a matrix, a local inner product. So it only, it's only defined for the local tangent space. It's not defined for the manifold. And, uh, and it provides a way to measure local uh, information about the angle length area that comes hand in hand with the inner product. And this is the restriction uh, positive definite matrix, uh, it can be 
Yeah, and uh, and it's and here it's a definition of intrinsic. So if if in differential geometry, if a quantity is defined only in terms of the Riemannian matrix, we say it's intrinsic. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and then this the notion of geodesics. The geodesics basically you have a curve on the surface of the manifold. And uh, basically you want to find uh, how long is this curve. And uh, you, you basically just uh, look at each, uh, each uh, tangent space, like all the tangent space it travels uh, with, with, with this curve. And then you can uh, sum up all those uh, Riemann metrics uh, that uh, on each local point. In the end, you get the integral of the line. And the geodesics is basically the, if you have a, uh, you have a curve that has a starting point and end point, you find the, the most, the, the minimum uh, length curve that's called the geodesic. And you can see the geodesics is completely defined by the Riemannian matrix. So it is also called intrinsic. The geodesic distance, uh, it, so for, for any two points on your manifold, you can uh, find, you can define this geodesic uh, distance, which as we see, it's, a, it's the geodesics is basically minimum of the length of a, uh, any possible connections between these two points. And if we use this as the metric for a metric space, then uh, we, get, we, we, we get this connection between uh, Riemannian manifold and the metric space. Uh, so this is like a, the Hoff Renault theorem. Metric completeness is equivalent to geodesic completeness. So it's basically you can turn your manifold into, you can analyze your manifold from the perspective of metric space if you define your metric to be the geodesic distance. And uh, the notion of parallel transport, uh, basically, how do you move a vector, a tangent vector uh, from point U to point V? So the definition is that um, on your way of moving, firstly, it has to be a geodesic. And second, the, uh, the Riemannian uh, matrix needs to, to stay the same. And the angle between your uh, the directive, uh, directional derivative of a curve and the, the uh, the tangent vector need to stay the same. If you if you satisfy these two constraints, you define a parallel transport. And the parallel transport, as you can see, is also kind of defined, restricted by the Riemannian matrix. So it's also intrinsic. Um, yeah, yeah. So this is basically how you transform a vector from one tangent space to another uh, by by a parallel a parallel transport. So all these concepts are basically helping us to define what is, a, what is the intrinsic geometry of a manifold. And then the exponential map, basically you want some mechanism that, uh, you know, that maps your uh, tangent vector to your curve. Uh, as you can see here, you, you, you project your tangent vector into a point on the manifold. And, uh, and, and that's basically a local map. Um, yeah, that's the exponential map. It, it, it can be also thought of as starting from the point U on the manifold, taking the direction of the uh, tangent vector X and you go like one time stamp in, in, in the tangent space. That's also like the exponential map. So, uh, so the exponential map is a completely local mapping from the uh, manifold to the to the uh, from from the tangent space to the manifold. It's kind of like a local flattening of your uh, of your manifold. After all, the whole idea of a differential is that uh, if you remember in calculus, the whole idea of a differential is that you want to have some local approximation that's smooth and easier to work with, and that's also the idea of your exponential map. So for each exponential map, you have this notion of injectivity radius, basically the maximum ball uh, that can be mapped from your tangent space to the manifold. Uh, uh, what, what it means diffeomorphically is basically uh, there's a, differ a differentiable mapping between these two. 
so um, so yeah, so as we early on talk about, um, we want to have some filters on the surface of the manifold that respects the metric, the Riemannian metrics. So how do we do that? Um, so let's see. If, um, so let's see. Uh, we have ten minutes. So let me let me let me show you. Um, let me show you some something about about uh, the definition of uh, transporting a matrix from one manifold to a deformed one. So um, right. So uh, let me see. Yeah, so let me just uh, start with the previous notepad. Um, and uh, let's, let's have like two manifolds. Uh, so let's say the first one is a, it's a rather regular sphere. The second one, it's a deformed sphere. So this is the original domain and uh, this is the deformed domain. And we call a deformation a map, eta, right? And if we have a point U on this manifold, it will be mapped to a point at U in the deformed manifold. And for each man, uh, local point, we can define a tangent space, which is a TU of uh, omega. And the tangent space leaves, and the tangent vectors leave on tangent space, right? X and Y. And here, we have a corresponding tangent space, which is T of eta u and a deformed omega. So, so there's a, so, and, and found by differential geometry, we can actually define a mapping between tangent spaces. So, so this is called the, uh, in differential geometry, the, the, the push forward. Basically a mapping between uh, tangent space, or in general, t tangent bundle, and and but uh, and and uh, and for, uh, to def to have the concept of a metric transportation, we need to have, you know, the notion of uh, what how does the matrix of this tangent space transform back? So let's say, let's say this this one this uh, this one this tangent space has a metric of G, and this tangent space have a, have a metric of H. Right, so we want to have a way to trans to find a mapping between G and H, right? So what is H? H can be defined by uh, the two tangent vectors that are living on the tangent space of this manifold. So what are the two tangent vectors? Remember the transfer the push forward that transforms one uh, tangent vector uh, tangent space to another. So the, the two tangent vector X and Y, they were transformed into d theta, uh, d theta X and d theta Y. And on the origin, so this is the original tangent space and this is the transformation on the deformed tangent space. So, and we kind of can define, you know, the, the inner product between them. And in this case, uh, by, by the Riemannian matrix, of course. So, so, so if we can use, um, sorry. So, so basically on the, on the original tangent space, we have a Riemannian matrix that defined over these two. On the new tangent space, we have a Riemannian matrix that defined for these two. And we want to find a mapping between these two. So, so we define this notion of, um, of a tangent, Okay, this should have a subscript because it's, uh, it's local to the point U. So, so we define this mapping between these two to be uh, eta star. And this in differential geometry is called the pullback of the, the tangent bundle. So, so, so in the end, we have this definition of a pullback, uh, pullback of uh, a matrix at the point U which takes in, uh, which sorry, which takes in the two tangent vectors of the original tangent space to be equal to the the um, the matrix in the other deformed uh, tra or transformed uh, tangent space. So that's the definition of a pullback. Um, 
uh, of two tangent bundles. So, so yeah, so this is a, is, is, is a definition. Uh, th and that's also written here. So I hope it's more clear written that way. And you see that the push forward between two tangent bundle or tangent space is you map every single tangent vector from one tangent space to the other tangent space. And the pullback is a, is a transform of, it's a transport of the, the matrix of one uh, tangent space to the other. So, and because we care about uh, matrix uh, intrinsic symmetry, which is basically after the transformation, we want our function to be uh, Riemannian matrix equivariant. We need to care about this uh, pullback. So, so if the after the, the deformation, the we, we, the, um, the the Riemannian matrix remain the same. If that's the case, then we say the transformation is isometric because it preserves the uh, the matrix, the Riemannian matrix. And this is the one kind of symmetry of a manifold is that you want to respect uh, uh, like the, the Riemannian matrix. So um, yeah, and this is just another theorem. Uh, if, so basically it's, it, it says if your uh, isometric mapping respects the Riemannian matrix, then because the geodesics and all those concepts we defined before, because they are only defined by the Riemannian matrix, they are also preserved. So the geodesics are preserved, the parallel transports are preserved, all these concepts are preserved if your mapping is isometric. So this gives the idea of an intrinsic convolution. The intrinsic convolution on the manifold basically says, uh, we want the convolution to be, uh, you know, Riemannian matrix equivariant, which basically means uh, isometry. And uh, and the first example again is the spectral convolution, and the spectral convolution is actually uh, isometric convolution. Uh, and yeah, and 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 basically, it gives you a very high level abstraction. So so it's uh, spectral convolution is a very powerful uh, technique in which you can just ignore the geometry and you just uh, do the, uh, the the Laplacian of the the space and uh, decompose it and then perform the convolution. However, as we know in graph convolu spectral convolution, the convolution is not very expressive. And this is a point that, uh, that's gonna be on later. And, uh, and even though the spectral convolution in theory is uh, intrinsic, it's not actually a symmetry. It's very unstable under the 3D object. So, so this is basically, you, ha you have a Fourier transform of the manifold and then if the horse runs this, you see that all the, all the um, local filters, they kind of turn into like all different kinds of stuff. So in theory, it is intrinsic, but in practice it's unstable. So, uh, so we can apply the same sort of scale separation principle to instead of using um, uh, the spectral convolution with the Fourier transform, you can stabilize it, use the trick of like a Chebyshev polynomial that's uh, I think we're also kind of uh, familiar with. And the second one is just the completely uh, forget Fourier transform. And you use wavelet transform to have localized uh, stabler filters over the entire geometric domain. So those are, in my opinion, like a two uh, very general way to deal with this kind of problem. And here, of course, the Fourier convolution, spectral convolution, uh, the, the shortcomings. So there's no such thing as a fast Fourier transform in the 3D space after you discretize the, uh, discretize the, uh, the geometric domain. And of course, the Fourier transform is global, no, no localized filter, so not very uh, deformation stable. Isotropic, which uh, I think we are kind of familiar with the graph spectral convolution. All the, all the spectral convolution are isotropic filters. So limited expressiveness, yeah, and the, the unable to 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 deal deal with deformation in practice. So, so instead of doing spectral, let's think about spatial. So the spatial convolution, the first idea, the naive convolution, it's very simple. You you don't care about you don't deal with the manifold. You only deal with the tangent bundle, or 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 for each point on your manifold, you kind of use the exponential map to uh to 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 get it. Uh, kind of a representation on the on the tangent space, and then 
because the tangent space is just Euclidean space. You can you can kind of do a convolution there. And and because the geodesics and, and a parallel transport, everything uh, are uh, you know are, are, are kind of expressed only in the Riemannian matrix. And here your convolution is also defined by the Riemannian matrix only. So it, it looks like a very promising uh, technique. However, this is not the case. And the reason is because uh, the computer cannot deal with abstract entities. You need a coordinate system to represent all these tangent vectors. And there's a problem is that you can choose any kind of uh, coordinate system you like. You, know? you can assign uh, all sorts of different uh, vectors or the numerical representations of the vectors. And uh, for different uh, reference or coordinate system you choose, you get different uh, filters. And that's not something we want. We want it to be uh, what's known as the gauge uh, symmetric. It, it shouldn't matter what, what coordinate system you choose. You should, you should get something that's more fundamental in your uh, convolution. And that brings us to the, to the end of this presentation. Uh, the, the idea is to apply something in the, in the gauge theory uh, to, to give your, to, re, uh, to respect the local gauge symmetry of your manifold. And uh, here are some very good reference. Uh, personally, I'm, all, I'm still studying this, this topic. So, so I can't really give a lot of more information, but it's, it's a very fundamental theory in, in mathematical physics. Uh, and I think it's, very, it's worth checking out if you are interested. Um, so yeah, that's my uh, presentation. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Thank Fred. You. Uh, it's very, very nice talk. So I, I have to go to attend another meeting. Um, I, I think you have already shared the slides with everyone. So I think, uh, yeah, if you could add some additional references to that, uh, it's going to be even better. But we probably need to pick up all those things through through uh, reading more and. Uh, yeah, that's what we're going to do in the in this quarter. Yeah, I'm glad I finished in time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye.